That's here God's holy, infallible, inspired Word. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after Thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill of Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spout. All thy waves and my billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. And God will add his blessing to that reading from his word to our hearts for his name's sake. Let's bow our heads for a moment in a word of prayer. Let's all pray. Our God, we do come in Jesus' name once again and pray that thou wilt now turn with us as we turn to thy word. We do not want to go on without thee. We pray thee now to abide with us. We ask Thee for the gracious workings of the Spirit of God. Open our eyes, our minds, our hearts to Thy truth. Give us the arms of faith to embrace it for ourselves. Help us, Lord, tonight to experience a personal word from God for our own souls. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. We come this evening to the first psalm, that is the first psalm of the second book of the Psalter. You see, the Jews, the original psalms were divided up into five books. And it is interesting to read of how the ancient rabbins saw in these five books of the Psalter uh, an image, a reflection of the first five books of the Bible, of the Pentateuch, whether that be a figment of their sanctified imagination or not, it is significant that this second book of the Psalter is so full of the experiences of God's people as they travel through the wilderness of this world. Much like Exodus, the second book of the Pentateuch is the account of God's people as they travel through their wilderness towards that land of blessing, the land of Canaan. The psalm before us this evening is entitled Maskil. This word simply means in the Hebrew, instructive. It's a psalm that was taught Israel, that had a special note of instruction. All of Psalms, of course, are instructive, but this was obviously given by the Spirit of God to have a special note of instruction about it. 
the writer of the psalm was experienced very much deeply in that pilgrim journey that God's people travel in this life. He knew very well what it was to travel upon the deep seas, upon the mighty oceans when the waves are crashing down into your little bark. He knew what it was to have a life that was filled with trouble, sorrow, heartache. He has experienced even the depths of depression and even despair. It's, it's, it's literal setting is the cry of a man who has been far removed from the, the, the normal uh, ordinances of religion. He's not able to get to church. He's not able to, to go with the people of God on the holy day and worship the Lord because of his situation. Most all the divines believe this psalm to be penned by David when he was fleeing from Absalom. That would be the literal setting. Spiritually, it is the voice of any believer who is suffering discouragement, suffering depression, and longing for the renewal of God's presence in his life. It's a common experience, this, of the Lord's people. These cycles where sometimes the sun is shining brightly and seems it doesn't come too long around the corner and the sun is gone. It's behind the clouds. And you're downcast. And yes, you even feel depression. I was reminded of that truth as I looked once again at this psalm right beside verse 6 of it. I have jotted down 9, 3, Oh, 03. That means on September the 3rd, this came up in McShane's reading, and I read it, and I felt that was my testimony. Oh, my God, my soul is cast down within me. I can't tell you what the circumstances were. I have no ability to recollect what was going on on September the 3rd of 2003. I was only here a year in the work, but I could say. David is uttering my own heart right now. What is interesting is I have another date, 9204, right below it. So a year later, I had the same experience. These cycles. Mountaintop sometimes, but often in the valley. Oft, McShane said, I walk beneath the cloud. It's one that the Lord's people will continually have to deal with in one form or another until they're called home or until Jesus comes again. Now, there is there's no shortage of, of things in life to bring about these troublesome times for God's people. And neither is there any shortage of books and, and booklets booklets that can be obtained that tell people how to overcome depression, how to overcome the discouragement, how to overcome the dark days. And despite the great popularity of, of such books, I feel that so many of them fail to do the job basically on two accounts. One they don't really address the root of most depression in Christians. They skirt the issue. They, they, they deal with symptoms and not with what's getting at the root of what's causing the problem. And secondly, so many of them don't treat it as a real spiritual problem, but simply a psychological problem. Let me interject here that I am in no way denying that depression and darkness of soul uh, can never be uh, sourced into a mind that has been diseased. Uh, the mind, the brain is an organ like any other part of your body and it can go south on you and that can definitely affect how you look at things. You use your mind to think, to, to reason. And if 
if the mind has been affected by some sickness, then your ability to look at things properly and to reason can often leave you. So I'm saying that uh, when so many of these booklets and counseling sessions uh, simply view this as a psychological problem and not a spiritual one. I am not denying the reality of true mental illness because it is there. But I'm dealing with most cases of depression among God's people. The difficulty for the Christian counselor, for the pastor, is to distinguish between how much of it is really a spiritual issue and how much of it is really a, a mental issue. A difficult. There's no fixed formula for figuring it out. But the fact of the matter remains, God's people suffer these cycles. In God's word in this psalm, it is an instructive psalm. <laughs> Believe you me, it's instructive. That shows how a Christian can overcome can face and work his way through depression and discouragement. Let's all be honest. We all become discouraged along the way. We all have experienced, I, I would surmise, depression of some level, some degree of depression. But what to do is the question. What, what do we do about it? Just wait till it passes? Try to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps? Go on a shopping spree? And hopefully by buying things, we're going to be happier? This word... Is the Word of God, and it will sustain us during those times. Consider with me, if you will, for a moment, and I say a moment because this throat of mine is not going to last. It wants to settle down into my chest, it feels like, so I don't want to leave myself on the sidelines. Divine direction for dark depression. Divine direction. For dark depression. We're going to look at David's problem. We're going to turn from that to look at David's probing. Then we're going to look at David's prospect. Then his plan, because he had one. And then his praise. First off, David's problem. David's problem. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? My soul is cast down. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and my billows are gone over me. One trouble after another has swept into my life. There has been no let up. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? He makes pretty clear the message of how he's feeling. And asking those questions. You know, it's good to get down to the very root of all of our depressions and our dark, our dark thoughts that we have about our situation, about life, about our peculiar set of circumstances. It's good to do that, to get to the root of the problem. Until we do, all we're going to do is try to treat the symptoms while neglecting to relieve the source of the depression and discouragement. It is the Christian's usual response in all of his 
darkness, uh, the feeling of defeat and despair. It's the user response to hope that there will be a change in the outward external circumstances that he believes is the source of all this depression. If, if God will just change my, my situation, if God will remove this that's causing me so much anxiety, if God will somehow take out of my life that thorn in my flesh... Or that individual that's bringing so much grief to my life. You, you can just go ahead. It's, it's, it's a fill in the blank. If that would just change, my depression would lift. Well, you see, folks, the fact of the matter is, there are people who have not a cloud in their sky in their temporal realm. They have no pressing monetary needs, no pressing physical needs. You look at their life and there's just nothing that you... Why should they be depressed? And yet they are. So it's, it's not the change in the situation that is the answer. As much as we, we tend to think that it is. We have a, a, a God in heaven who is the God of all providence. And in providence, He has decreed that certain things enter our lives. And every one of them come in on schedule. Not one is late. Not one is too early. Not one is too much. Not one is too little. Everything to the smallest item has been ordered by a wise providence. And when those dark providential dealings come from God, our hopes have often been dashed against the rocks. As I was discussing with someone recently, I can't remember if it was on the long ride up to Ohio or at the week of prayer, but so often the, 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 the feeling is for God's people, and this is what so often uh, precedes the, the, the dark days of depression, it was, it was all going so well. It was going so well. And I expected something different to happen than this happened. Certainly, I didn't expect this. And our hopes are dashed against the rocks. And that, that awful enemy of fear that Paul and I were talking about this afternoon, that awful enemy of fear grips our hearts. And it starts affecting how we think. We fail to think biblically. We fail to think rationally. Because fear has filled the soul. Paul told Timothy, who was very timid, who was affected by fear of his circumstances, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, since it doesn't come from God, we know where it comes from. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. That's what God gives to His people. But when fear, because of our situation, because of our circumstances, fills the life, where all around you, all around you, the, there's great upheaval, and your future is so uncertain, when we look to our situation... To bring us the peace of mind and the calm of soul, we just take a nosedive emotionally. And we crash. You crash. You get depressed. And then when we, you and I are depressed, we are not pleasant to be around. 
that depression affects other people. It's, um, it's strange the way it works. It, it's almost a contagiousness about it. It's right there when we think that a change in what's causing us as we view it, what's causing us this, this heartache and this, this depressed spirit is going to be the answer. It's right there that we fail. We think that the turn of events is going to change, change everything. But the psalm before us tonight, it, it, it is a, a very stark argument against that reasoning. David, if, if the commentators are right, and, and who am I? You know, I, I'm no Hebrew scholar. But all, all these men who have given their lives to studying these things, the divines we call them. If the commentators are right, David was now fleeing from his own son. And he was doing that because of sin with Bathsheba when God said, you're going to pay for this, David, the rest of your life. I will not remove the sword from your house. You're going to have trouble from your family till the day you die. So here he is, understanding I am getting what's coming to me. The Lord told me I am now having to flee my own city from my own son who has rebelled against me. He has drawn a large number of the people about him. David's future is very, very uncertain. He is in fear of his own life and the lives of his servants. The kingdom was tottering in the balances. He did not know what the future held. Yet when you read this, when you read this psalm, you don't find David mourning about these things. He is mourning about not having the presence of God. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. That's what's taking up his mind. Where are you, Lord? Where are you? First out of his lips. First thing out of his lips. I am panting after you, Lord. Where are you? Not, Lord, reverse my set of circumstances. Thirsting after the Lord like a heart, like a deer that's being chased by the hunter. That's the imagery. Just just get me to the water, the deer says in essence, and all will be well. David says, just, if I can just get to God. David knew that the answer to his trouble and depression was the felt presence of God again in his soul. That's what he's wanting. That was it. That's why he keeps talking about the health of, his, of God's countenance and the help of God's countenance. Twice he brings that picture up of the face of God shining upon him. That's all I want. It'll be well with me. Why am I cast down? Lord, I want the health and the help of your countenance. That's his focus. I don't want you to miss that. How the Lord's people, how we would be helped when we have got to pen down beside that particular verse the month and the day and the year of when our souls are cast down to remember it is the countenance of God's face that's going to change things. David's problem is deepened at the taunt of his enemies. They keep saying to him, he keeps bringing this up in the psalm, Where is now thy God? You profess to be a follower of Jehovah. You profess that he is the defender of his people. And now, where is he, David? David? 
That, that, that question about the enemy taunting him could have, it could have, if this is the case, if the divines are right, it, it could have a reference to Shimei, who cursed David and threw stones at him as he was leaving the royal city and fleeing from his son Absalom. God is judging you. How cruel that would be. But the devil is cruel after all, isn't it? That's exactly what Job's friends came along and did with Job as he sits there. He's lost all of his children. He's lost his wealth. He can't recover it. And now he's covered with boils. <laughs> and he sits down in the ashes and all his friends have to come along and say, uh, Job, you're a hypocrite. That's why you're going through this. Great, great. Wouldn't you love to have friends like Job's? That's why you're going through. Where is God? When you're down in the depths of depression, Satan will come along and kick you. There's no compassion upon your tears. He knows what your depression is doing to your family. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He'll kick you good and hard. He'll come along and suggest to you, where is your God? Your God's left you. After all, you, you, you've been so disobedient. You're not much of a Christian. Matter of fact, you failed. You're a big fat failure. You're a, you're a big fat failure. He says to you. You failed as a father. You failed as a mother. You failed as a husband. You failed as a wife. You failed as a Christian. God has left you. You're getting what you deserve. You know, it's one thing to be in depression. But it's quite another thing when you're in depression to... To be convinced that all hope is gone. That there will never, you will never, never see any light at the end of a very dark, long tunnel. And I have been there. This is not theory with me. I've been there and done that. The demons of hell know that the worst thing that could happen to us would be to lose God's favor. They know that. And that is the worst thing that could... To lose God's favor. That's the worst that could ever happen to us. And they will tell us that that's what's happened. You've lost the favor of God. I thank the Lord that God has revealed it in His Word on many occasions that the devil is, the, is a liar and the father of lies. So I need not listen to his rantings and his ravings. Because I know something, if, no, if, if nowhere else from the, from the cross of Jesus Christ, that Satan always wants to put a question mark over that which God has said is divine certainty. If thou be the Son of God, come down. If you are him. It was an awful thing to say to Jesus Christ in the suffering. It was awful. But you see, it wasn't a question of, are you, if you... Oh, he is definitely the Son of God. But the question mark is put there. Where is your God that you profess, David, you knew? Here we are, Christians. Here we are, professing our hope in God, our faith in the Lord, our belief in His Word... And here we are, here we are in the depths of depression. But David's depression is deepened by his memory. His memory. He says in verse 4, When I remember these things. What things? I had gone with the multitude. 
I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. When I remember how it used to be, he says, I pour out my soul in me. He remembered the old days. And he just wept. You ever been there? You remember the old days. And you want so much the old days to come back. He remembered how he would go to the house of God with joy. He would meet with the Lord, with the multitude. Happy, happy days they were. Days when things were far better than they were now. It reminded me again of of Job, who said in his depression, Oh, that I were as in months past. Oh, that I were as in months. I long for the old days when God's light was upon me when His face shone down. Days when I prayed and got answers from God. Days when my heart was burning within me for the Lord. Days when my faith was bright and my hope was strong. Days when I had influence with others, as Job goes on to point out. For the Christian, you see... It's a blessed thing there's a past to remember. It's a blessed thing to remember that there were brighter days. We forget to think about it like that. The reason there is hope for the present depression is because there was a past of brighter days. Verse 6, O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, therefore, because of this depression, I will, I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill of Mizar, from my present depressing circumstances. I'll remember I'll remember you. This is the thought that seems to be the actual turning point in David's own thinking in this psalm. For if there was a past with God, there must be a future with God. If there was a past with God, there has to be a future with God because this God never changes. That's David's problem. Now David's probing. In verse 5, he begins to talk to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? He begins to, to make himself reason about his circumstances. It's a vital element in dealing with our depression. One, it sounds, might sound strange to you, but, and I, I think it's been many years since I've read the book, but I, I believe Lloyd-Jones brings this out in his book, Spiritual Depression, Its Causes, Characteristics, and Cures. One of the, the, the best things you and I can do in our depression is to talk to ourselves. That's what David's doing. He's talking to himself. 
What's our tendency? <laughs> it's to talk to everybody else about it. David's talking to himself. To reason with himself. And what the child of God needs in the midst of his depression is an objective view of the whole situation. I've often said tongue-in-cheek, you know, it's okay to talk to yourself. It's okay even to answer yourself. But when you say, huh, that you've got a real problem. You you really are a multi-personality at that juncture. But we must talk to ourselves and talk back to ourselves. David's doing this. Why are you cast down, David? Why are you like this? Why is your thinking like this? Why do you feel like this? Everything is being interpreted wrongly. And you need light. You need to think properly about your set of circumstances. Yes, it's, it's no fun, you know, to be brought... Uh, to a place where your son has rebelled against you, is trying to overthrow you, and would take your life. Your son would take your life. Perhaps it would. What we all need to do is to, when we are depressed, is to step out of ourselves. Not be consumed with going over and over and over again everything why am I cast down? What's, what's the real root of the matter here? And look at the whole situation in light of God's truth. We need to come back to what we know is bedrock truth in our thinking. Regardless of what we don't understand about the Scriptures, we come back to what we know is bedrock truth. In times of distress and despair, it is... Best that you first encourage yourself in the Lord before you ever go praying about it. My old friend David is the perfect example of that. When he came back and his city of Ziklag was burned to the ground, the women and children were taken. The men wanted to stone him. They're all crying their eyes out because they weep no more. And it says that David first encouraged himself in the Lord. And then he inquired of the Lord. That order is so important to you and I, child of God. You know, you can go, you can go in, in your depression and pray and pray and weep and cry and pray some more and no depression is lifted. There has got to be an encouraging yourself first in the Lord and the truth of His Word. And here they were wanting to stone David. But what did David do? Now, wait a minute. They want to stone me. It looks like I'm going to be dead here. And things look so bad, but this God has promised me that I am going to be the next king of Israel. And God's God's word has got to come to pass. It's all right. He talked to himself. He talked to himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Have you done that in your depression? Maybe you're depressed tonight. Maybe you've been depressed for a long time. I want to ask you the question, have you talked to yourself? Have you talked to yourself? Have you set yourself in light of the objective truth of God's Word? Here's what is true. No matter what I feel, here is divine truth. And my God is not a liar. The devil is He is not a liar. What is written is written. It is forever sealed and settled. It's in heaven where it can't be assailed. Therefore, here's the objective truth. Regardless of what I feel, here's the truth. He reasons in this psalm, and it comes actually throughout it, but particularly at the end, that there is hope in God. 
there's hope. There's hope. In other words, <laughs> when you cannot see any light at the end of your dark tunnel, and you don't believe there's ever going to be one there, the fact is, there is always hope in the Lord for you, for the situation. It doesn't say that you're going to get what you want in your situation. But the Lord will be with you. David ponders something else. He probes as he probes. Why aren't they cast down? He remembers that in the midst of a valley of depression, God was there. Right there with him. And so he says in verse 6, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill of Mizar. Now, that was not where he wanted to be. He's fled from Jerusalem because of his son. But while it's not where he wanted to be, he knew that God was there with him. God was not, God's presence was not limited to Jerusalem. And let me tell you something, God's presence is not limited to you when you're on the mountaintop. Oh, my memory fails me, but I don't remember the army that came against Israel. Ah, oh, they said, ah, you beat us because he was the God of the mountains and not the God of the valleys. And well, God just showed them, I'm going to beat them in the valleys as well as the mountains. What a wonderful truth. He is the God of the mountains and he's the God of the valleys. It was a low point for David. I can't imagine how low it would be to have your own son. Can't imagine that. It'd break your heart. And this one whom he spared, this one whom he loved, the one whom he mourned over, Absalom, oh my son Absalom, he loved so much, wants rid of David, his father. And yet, while it was where David did not want to be, he knew that God was with him right there. He remembered the Lord. He's probing, you see. He's probing. And there you are in your depression. And whether or not you feel it is not the point. I'd like to feel it. You know, I, I wouldn't have written 9303 and 9204. But times when you don't feel it, you don't feel God's anywhere near you. But he said, didn't he, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He said that. Did he mean it or did he not? Was he telling the truth? I've not left you as orphans. I've not left you in this world to get through your trials and troubles and depressions all by yourself. I'm with you in them all. I knew about that depression. I knew about your tendency to turn everything black and paint with a black. I knew about that. I made you. I knew exactly how you were going to respond to that trial. I'm God. It hasn't taken me by surprise. I have ordered this for your good. And I am with you in your valley of depression. As much as I am with you on the top of the mountain when you're full of joy. I am with you. Remember the Lord. There's the key. Remember the Lord. Remember who He is. David's prospect. Thirdly, when David stepped back from the whole dilemma, talked to himself, got his thinking in line with truth, divine truth, his faith, was strengthened. He now has a bright outlook about life. A bright prospect instead of a bleak problem. 
Look what he says in verse 8. Here he talks about it in verse, get the context, verse 7. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Oh, it's so black and bad. Yet, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me. The Lord will command. Underline that word command, please. Because that word speaks of God as being sovereign and ruling in all the details and affairs of my life and yours. He will command in the midst of the waves and the wind howling and blowing. He will command what? What? His loving kindness. When you're depressed, you've lost sight of God's loving kindness. You've forgotten all about His tender mercies. And that's why you go looking for something else to lift your depression. You hunt everywhere else but where you need to be looking. David's come to his, he's come to his senses. Even though the billows of God are over my head, yet, it, my, you know, thy billows, he says, these are your billows? You will command your loving kindness. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And like the great king that he is, like the great king that he is, God is going to command, he's going to give to his chosen people the apple of his eye, his loving kindness. My, what did he say? My loving kindness I will never take from thee. When you or I find ourselves sitting down in our little corners, feeling so sorry for ourselves and for our situation, and so depressed, it is there we must remember the loving kindness of God, and God will command that loving kindness to break over His billows and His waves. My old friend, William Cowper, said, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are filled with mercy and shall break with blessings on your head. No day will ever dawn on the child of God will he find himself forsaken by God and God's loving kindness taken away. He will always deal with you in tender, tender mercy. I've been so often helped by the truth stated by Isaiah. Isaiah. When the Lord promised that he will not break the bruised reed, nor quench the smoking flax. The bruised reed so weak. Just one little and it's broken. The smoking flax about to go out. Hardly an ember that's glowing. God says, I'm not going to put it out. He knows your frame. He knows your dust. And he pities you. If we just understood how much he pities us in our weakness, in our depression. We're not disgusting to him. He's not fed up with us. People may, but not our Father. This this prospect of David grew brighter. He says, in the night, in verse 8, not only will God command the loving kindness, but in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer to the God of my life. Night songs. Can't explain them other than God gives you a song in the night season. God puts a hymn in your heart and you sing it to him. 
you're able to sing in the midst even of the depression. My prayer <laughs> will be to the God of my life. Lead me to say that David has a plan here. Now that he's turned his eyes upon the Lord and found there was indeed hope there, he states his intention of going to God and reasoning with Him. Verse 9, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? It's good, you know. He first says, to my soul, why art thou cast down? Now he says, I'm going to go to God and I'm going to ask Him. Remember he said, I'm going to pray. Prayer to my God. Here's my prayer. Here's what it's going to be. I will say to God in prayer, Why? Why hast thou forgotten me? Why is this happening, Lord? It's good to do. Good to do. It could be that there's a need for discipline. It could be that there's the need to purge idols from our lives that we've erected. And they become our first love instead of Him. It could be that these things have come about that we might thirst after Him as the heart thirst after the water brook. And we've not been doing that. Ultimately, it's always to bring us to Himself. Why is he doing it? David's plan is to pray. To fail to do this. To fail to take the whole thing to God in prayer. And say, Lord, why? It will cause the adversity to be more mysterious than it needs to be. And hopeless when it really isn't. I close with David's his praise. He says in verse 5, I shall yet praise him with the help of his countenance. In verse 11, I shall yet praise him with the health of my countenance and my God. Praise Him for the help of His countenance. I will yet praise Him who is the health of my countenance. It's hard, particularly with family, to hide depression. You don't feel there's any need to hide it because you're among family. It shows in the countenance. How long the face becomes. How dull and listless the eyes. The sparkle goes. The singing is not there in the shower. The whistling is not there around the home. Sadness is set in. The countenance is sad. What it needs is health again, because it's sick. It's sick. The only the only remedy for the countenance that is sick is the help of God's countenance. I'm reminded of Moses on top of the mount when he met with the Lord and he came down and his face shone. Oh, how healthy it was. It glowed. It glowed. It glowed. His plan was to pray. His plan was to get into God's presence and to reason with God. He did that he said, because of that, I shall yet. Yes, I, 
I am in a hard, hard place and my soul is cast down. I go mourning. All of that is true. But this is not going to last. I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. God is going to look upon me again. And my face is going to glow again. It's going to be healthy again. And therefore I know I will praise Him. I know I will praise Him. Simply put, that's divine direction for dealing with dark depression. God read His Word upon our hearts for His name's sake. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's all pray. Father in heaven, we come in Jesus' name. The name that charms our fears and bids our sorrow cease. We do believe that if we have Jesus only, we have a star against a black sky. In the midst of all the thorns of life, we have the rose of Sharon. We thank Thee that when the waves are at their highest and the wind is blowing its fiercest, Jesus is with us in the ship. Lord, these are truths we have heard all our lives. We confess the problem is always the same thing. Unbelief. Lord, we believe. Help Thou our unbelief, we pray. And to learn from this psalm called Maskeel, instruction, we would learn how to deal with our dark days. We do pray for Thy countenance to shine upon us, that our countenance might be healthy. That others would see the Lord in us. And we would experience that praise that comes as a result. Grant that we will be a happy people. That we might glorify Thee in our joy. And when depression settles into our souls, give us the grace we pray, O God, when that cycle comes round. Give us the grace to follow Thy Word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.